We need to talk, Holly said. So talk, Reacher replied. They were sprawled out on the mattresses in the gloom inside the truck, rocking and bouncing, but not much. It was pretty clear they were heading down a highway. After 15 minutes of a slow straight road, there had been a deceleration, a momentary stop, and a left turn followed by steady acceleration up a ramp. Then a slight sway as the truck nudged left onto the pavement. Then a steady droning cruise, maybe 60 miles an hour, which had continued ever since and was feeling like it would continue forever. The temperature inside the dark space had slowly climbed higher. Now it was pretty warm. Reacher had taken his shirt off. But the truck had started to cool, from the night in the cow barn, and Reacher felt as long as it kept moving through the air, it was going to be tolerable. The problem would come if they stopped for any length of time. Then the truck would heat up like a pizza oven and it would get as bad as it had gotten the day before. The twin-sized mattress had been standing upright on its long edge, up against the forward bulkhead, and the queen size had been flat on the floor, jammed up against it, making a crude sofa. But the 90-degree angle between the seat and the back had made the whole thing uncomfortable. So Reacher had slid the queen size backward, with Holly riding on it like a sled, and laid the twin flat next to it. Now they had an 8 foot by 6 6 flat padded area. They were lying down on their backs, heads together so they could talk, bodies apart in a decorous V-shape, rocking gently with the motion of the ride. You should do what I tell you, Holly said. You should have gotten out. He made no reply. You're a burden to me, she said. You understand that. I've got enough on my hands here without having to worry about you. He didn't reply. They lay rocking in silence. He could smell yesterday morning's shampoo in her hair. So you've got to do what I tell you from now on, she said. Are you listening to me? I just can't afford to be worrying about you. He turned his head to look at her, close up. She was worrying about him. It came as a big surprise, out of nowhere. A shock. Like being on a train, stopped next to another train in a busy railroad station. Your train begins to move. It picks up speed, and then all of a sudden it's not your train moving. It's the other train. Your train was stationary all the time. Your frame of reference was wrong. He thought his train was moving. She thought hers was. I don't need your help, she said. I've already got all the help I need. You know how the bureau works. You know what the biggest crime in the world is. Not bombing, not terrorism, not racketeering. The biggest crime in the world is messing with bureau personnel. The bureau looks after its own. Reacher stayed quiet for a spell. Then he smiled. So then we're both okay, he said. We just lay back here, and pretty soon a bunch of agents is going to come bursting in to rescue us. I trust my people, Holly said to him. There was silence again. The truck droned on for a couple of minutes. Reacher ticked off the distance in his head. About 450 miles from Chicago, maybe. East. West, north, or south. Holly gasped and used both hands to shift her leg. Hurting, Reacher said. When it gets out of line, she said. When it's straight, it's okay. Which direction are we headed? He asked. Are you going to do what I tell you? She asked. Is it getting hotter or colder? He said. Or staying the same? She shrugged. Can't tell, she said. Why? North or south? It should be getting hotter or colder, he said east or west, it should be staying more or less the same. Feels the same to me, she said. But inside here, you can't really tell. Highway feels fairly empty, Reacher said. We're not pulling out to pass people. We're not getting slowed down by anybody. We're just cruising. So, Holly said. Might mean we're not going east, he said. There's a kind of barrier, right? Cleveland to Pittsburgh to Baltimore. Like a frontier. Gets much busier. We'd be hitting more traffic. What is it, Tuesday? About 11 o'clock in the morning. Roads feel too empty for the east. Holly nodded. So we're going north or west or south, she said. In a stolen truck, he said. Vulnerable. Stolen, she said. How do you know that? Because the car was stolen too, he said. How do you know that, she repeated. Because they burned it, he said. Holly rolled her head and looked straight at him. Think about it, he said. Think about their plan. They came to Chicago in their own vehicle. Maybe some time ago. Could have taken them a couple of weeks to stake you out. Maybe three. 
Three weeks, she said. You think they were watching me three weeks? Probably three, he said. You went to the cleaners every Monday, right? Once a week. Must have taken them a while to confirm that pattern. But they couldn't grab you in their own vehicle. Too easy to trace, and it probably had windows and all, not suitable for long-distance transport of a kidnap victim. So I figure they stole this truck, in Chicago, probably yesterday morning. Painted over. Whatever writing was on the side. You notice the patch of white paint. Fresh, didn't match the rest. They disguised it, maybe changed the plates. But it was still a hot truck, right, greater than and it was the getaway vehicle. So they didn't want to risk it on the street. And people getting into the back of a truck looks weird. A car is better. So they stole the black sedan and used that instead. Switched vehicles in that vacant lot, burned the black car, and they're away. Polly shrugged, made a face. Doesn't prove they stole anything, she said. Yes it does, Reacher said. Who buys a new car with leather seats, knowing they're going to burn it? They'd have bought some old clunker instead. She nodded, reluctantly. Who are these people, she said, more to herself than to Reacher. Amateurs, Reacher said. They're making one mistake after another. Like what, she said. Burning is dumb, he said attracts attention. They think they've been smart, but they haven't. Probability is they burned their original car, as well. I bet they burned it right near where they stole the black sedan. Sounds smart enough to me, Holly said. Cops notice burning cars, Reacher said. They'll find the black sedan, they'll find out where it was stolen from, they'll go up there and find their original vehicle, probably still smoldering. They're leaving a trail, Holly. They should have parked both cars in the long-term lot at O'Hare. They would have been there a year before anybody noticed. Or just left them both down on the south side somewhere, doors open, keys in. Two minutes later, two residents down there got themselves a new motor each. Those cars would never have been seen again. That's how to cover your tracks. Burning feels good, feels like it's real final, but it's dumb as hell. Holly turned her face back and stared up at the hot metal roof. She was asking herself, just who the hell is this guy? This time, McGrath did not make the tech chief come down to the third floor. He led the charge himself up to his lab on the sixth, with the video cassette in his hand. He burst in through the door and cleared a space on the nearest table. Laid the cassette in the space like it was made of solid gold. The guy hurried over and looked at it. I need photographs made, McGrath told him. The guy picked up the cassette and took it across to a bank of video machines in the corner. Flicked a couple of switches. Three screens lit up with white snow. You tell absolutely nobody what you're seeing, okay? McGrath said. Okay, the guy said. What am I looking for? The last five frames, McGrath said. That should just about cover it. The tech chief didn't use a remote. He stabbed at buttons on the machine's own control panel. The tape rolled backward and the story of Holly Johnson's kidnap unfolded in reverse. Christ, he said. He stopped on the frame showing Holly turning away from the counter. Then he inched the tape forward. He jumped Holly to the door, then face to face with the tall guy, then into the muzzles of the guns, then to the car. He rolled back and did it for a second time. Then a third. Christ, he said again. Don't wear the damn tape out, McGrath said. I want big photographs of those five frames. Lots of copies. The tech chief nodded slowly. I can give you laser prints right now, he said. He punched a couple of buttons and flicked a couple of switches. Then he ducked away and booted up a computer on a desk across the room. The monitor came up with Holly leaving the dry cleaner's counter. He clicked on a couple of menus. Okay, he said, I'm copying it to the hard disk, as a graphics file. He darted back to the video bank and nudged the tape forward one frame. Came back to the desk and the computer captured the image of Holly making to push open the exit door. He repeated the process three more times. Then he printed all five graphics files on the fastest laser he had. McGrath stood and caught each sheet as it flopped into the output bin. Not bad, he said. I like paper better than video. Like it really exists. The tech chief gave him a look and peered over his shoulder. Definition's okay, he said. I want blow-ups, McGrath told him. 
No problem, now it's in the computer, the text said. That's why the computer is better than paper. He sat down and opened the fourth file. The picture of Holly and the three kidnappers in a tight knot on the sidewalk scrolled onto the screen. He clicked the mouse and pulled a tight square around the heads. Clicked again. The monitor read through into a large blow-up. The tall guy was staring straight out of the screen. The two new guys were caught at an angle, staring at Holly. The tech hit the print button and then he opened the fifth file. He zoomed in with the mouse and put a tight rectangle around the driver, inside the car. He printed that out, too. McGrath picked up the new sheets of paper. Good, he said. Good as we're going to get, anyway. Shame your damn computer can't make them all look right at the camera. It can, the tech chief said. It can, McGrath said. How? In a manner of speaking, the guy said. He touched the blow-up of Holly's face with his finger. Suppose we wanted a face front. Picture of her, right. We'd ask her to move around right in front of the camera and look right up at it. But suppose for some reason she can't move at all. What would we do? We could move the camera. Right, greater than suppose you climbed up on the counter and unbolted the camera off the wall and moved it down and around a certain distance until it was right in front of her. Then you'd be seeing a face front picture, correct? Okay, McGrath said. So what we do is we calculate, the text said. We calculate that if we did hypothetically move that camera right in front of her, we'd have to move it what? Say six feet downward, say ten feet to the left, and turn it through about forty degrees, and then it would be plumb face on to her. So we get those numbers and we enter them into the program and the computer will do a kind of backward simulation, and draw us a picture. Just the same as if we'd really moved the actual camera right around in front of her. You can do that, McGrath said. Does it work? Within its limitations, the tech chief said. He touched the image of the nearer gunman. This guy, for instance, he's pretty much side on. The computer will give us a full face picture, no problem at all. But it's going to be just guessing what the other side of his face looks like, right? Greater than it's programmed to assume the other side looks pretty much like the side it can see, with a little bit of asymmetry built in. But if the guy's got one ear missing or something, or a big scar, it can't tell us that. Okay, McGrath said, so what do you need? The chief tech picked up the wide shot of the group, pointed here and there on it with a stubby forefinger. Measurements, he said, make them as exact as possible. I need to know the camera position relative to the doorway and the sidewalk level. I need to know the focal length of the camera lens. I need Holly's file photograph for calibration. We know exactly what she looks like, right? I can use her for a test run. I'll get it set up so she comes out right, then the other guys will come out right as well, assuming. They've all got two ears and so on, like I said. And bring me a square of tile off the store's floor and one of those smocks the counterwoman was wearing. What for? McGrath said. So I can use them to decode the greys in the video, the text said. Then I can give you your mug shots in color. The commander selected six women from that morning's punishment detail. He used the ones with the most demerits, because the task was going to be hard and unpleasant. He stood them at attention and drew his huge bulk up to its full height in front of them. He waited to see which of them would be the first to glance away from his face. When he was satisfied none of them dared to, he explained the duties. The blood had sprayed all over the room, hulled around by the savage centrifugal force of the blade. Chips of bone had spatted everywhere. He told them to heat water in the cookhouse and carry it over in buckets. He told them to draw scrubbing brushes and rags and disinfectant from the stores. He told them they had two hours to get the room looking pristine again. Any longer than that, they would earn more demerits. It took two hours to get the data. Milosevic and Brogan went out to the dry cleaning establishment. They closed the place down and swarmed all over it like surveyors. They drew a plan with measurements accurate to the nearest quarter inch. They took the camera off the wall and brought it back with them. They tore up the floor and took the tiles. They took two smocks from the woman and two posters off the wall, because they thought they might help with the colorizing process. 
Back on the sixth floor of the federal building, the chief tech took another two hours to input the data. Then he ran the test, using Holly Johnson to calibrate the program. What do you think? He asked McGrath. McGrath looked hard at the full face picture of Holly. Then he passed it around. Milosevic got it last and stared at it hardest. Covered some parts with his hand and frowned. Makes her look too thin, he said. I think the bottom right quarter is wrong. Not enough width there, somehow. I agree, McGrath said. Makes her jaw look weird. The chief tech exited to a menu screen and adjusted a couple of numbers. Ran the test again. The laser printer word. The sheet of stiff paper came out. That's better, McGrath said. Just about on the nose. Color okay, the tech asked. Should be a darker peach, Milosevic said. On her dress. I know that dress. Some kind of an Italian thing. The tech exited to a color palette. Show me, he said. Milosevic pointed to a particular shade. More like that, he said. They ran the test again. The hard disk chatted and the laser printer word. That's better, Milosevic said. Dress is right. Hair color is better as well. Okay, the tech said. He saved all the parameters to disk. Let's go to work here. The FBI never uses latest generation equipment. The feeling is it's better to use stuff that has been proven in the field. So the tech chief's computer was actually a little slower than the computers in the rich kids' bedrooms up and down the North Shore. But not much slower. It gave McGrath five prints within 40 minutes. Four mug shots of the four kidnappers, and a close-up side view of the front half of their car. All in glowing color, all with the grain enhanced and smoothed away. McGrath thought they were the best damn pictures he had ever seen. Thanks, chief, he said. These are brilliant. Best work anybody has done around here for a long time. But don't say a word. Big secret, right? He clapped the tech on the shoulder and left him feeling like the most important guy in the whole building. The six women worked hard and finished just before their two hours were up. The tiny cracks between the boards were their biggest problem. The cracks were tight, but not tight enough to stop the blood seeping in. But they were too tight to get a brush down in there. They had to sluice them out with water and rag them dry. The boards were turning a wet brown color. The women were praying they wouldn't warp as they dried. Two of them were throwing up. It was adding to their workload. But they finished in time for the commander's inspection. They stood rigidly at attention on the damp floor and waited. He checked everywhere, with the wet boards creaking under his bulk. But he was satisfied with their work and gave them another two hours to clean the smears off the corridor and the staircase, where the body had been dragged away. The car was easy. It was quickly identified as a Lexus. Four-door. Late model. The pattern of the alloy wheel dated it exactly. Color was either black or dark gray. Impossible to be certain. The computer process was good, but not good enough to be definitive about dark automotive paint standing in bright sunshine. Stolen, Milosevic said. McGrath nodded. Almost certainly, he said. You do the checking, okay. Fluctuations in the value of the yen had put the list price of a new Lexus four-door somewhere up there with Milosevic's annual salary. So he knew which jurisdictions were worth checking with and which weren't. He didn't bother with anywhere south of the loop. He put in calls to the Chicago cops, and then all the departments on the North Shore right up to Lake Forest. He got a hit just before noon. Not exactly what he was looking for. Not a stolen Lexus, but a missing Lexus. The police department in Wilmot came back to him and said a dentist up there had driven his brand new Lexus to work, before 7 on Monday morning. And parked it in the lot behind his professional building. A chiropractor from the next office suite had seen him turn into the lot. But the dentist had never made it into the building. His nurse had called his home and his wife had called the Wilmot PD. The cops had taken the report and sat on it. It wasn't the first case of a husband disappearing they'd ever heard of. They told Milosevic the guy's name was Ruben and the car was the new shade of black, mica flex in the paint to make it sparkle, and it had vanity plates reading, Ortho 1. Milosevic put the phone down on that call and it rang again straight away with a report from the Chicago Fire Department. A unit had attended an automobile fire which 
was putting up a cloud of oily smoke into the land side flight path into Meg's Field Airport. The fire truck had arrived in an abandoned industrial lot just before 1 o'clock Monday and found a black Lexus burning fiercely. They had figured it was burned to the metal anyway, not much more smoke to come, so they had saved their foam and just left it to burn out. Milosevic copied the location and hung up. Ducked into McGrath's office for instructions. Check it out, McGrath told him. Milosevic nodded. He was always happy with road work. It gave him the chance to drive his own brand new Ford Explorer, which he liked to use in preference to one of the Bureau's clunky sedans. And the Bureau liked to let him do exactly that, because he never bothered to claim for his personal gas. So he drove the big shiny four-wheel drive five miles south and found the wreck of the Lexus, no trouble at all. It was parked at an angle on a lumpy concrete area behind an abandoned industrial building. The tires had burned away and it was settled on the rims. The plates were still readable, also one. He poked through the drifts of ash inside, still slightly warm, and then he pulled the shaft of the burned key from the ignition and popped the trunk. Then he staggered four steps away and threw up on the concrete. He retched and spat and sweated. He pulled his cellular phone from his pocket and fired it up. Got straight through to McGrath in the federal building. I found the dentist, he said. Where? McGrath asked. In the damn trunk, Milosevic said. Slow roasted. Looks like he was alive when the fire started. Christ, McGrath said. Is it connected? No doubt about that, he said. You sure? McGrath asked him. No doubt about it, Milosevic said again. I found other stuff. Burned, but it's all pretty clear. There's a 38 right in the middle of what looks like a metal hinge, could be from a woman's pocketbook, right? Coins, and a lipstick tube, and the metal parts from a mobile phone and a pager. And there are nine wire hangers on the floor. Like you get from a dry cleaner. Christ, McGrath said again. Conclusions. They stole the Lexus up in Wilmot, Milosevic said. Maybe the dentist guy disturbed them in the act. So he went for them and they overpowered him and put him in the trunk. Burned him along with the rest of the evidence. Shit, McGrath said. But where's Holly? Conclusions on that. They took her to Meg's field, Milosevic said. It's about a half mile away. They put her in a private plane and dumped the car right here. That's what they did, Mac. They flew her out somewhere. Four guys, capable of burning another guy up while he was still alive, they've got her alone somewhere, could be a million miles away from here by now. The white truck droned on, steadily, another hour, maybe 60 more miles. The clock inside Reach's head ticked around from 11 to 12 noon. The first faint stirrings of worry were building inside him. They had been gone a day, nearly a full 24 hours. Out of the first phase, into the middle phase. No progress. And he was uncomfortable. The air inside the vehicle was about as hot as air could get. They were still lying fat on their backs on the hot mattress, heads together. The horsehair padding was overheating them. Holly's dark hair was damp and spread out. On her left, it was curled against Reach's bare shoulder. Is it because I'm a woman? She asked, tense. Or because I'm younger than you? Or both? Is what because? He asked back, wary. You think you've got to take care of me, she said. You're worrying about me, because I'm young and a woman, right? You think I need some older man's help? Reacher stirred. He didn't really want to move. He wasn't comfortable, but he guessed he was happy enough where he was. In particular, he was happy with the feel of Holly's hair against his shoulder. His life was like that. Whatever happened, there were always some little compensations available. Well, she asked, it's not a gender thing, Holly, he said, or an age thing, but you do need help, right? And I'm a younger woman and you're an older man, she said. Therefore obviously you're the one qualified to give it. Couldn't be the other way around, right? Reacher shook his head, lying down. It's not a gender thing, he said again, or an age thing. I'm qualified because I'm qualified, is all. I'm just trying to help you out. You're taking stupid risks, she said. Pushing them and antagonizing them is not the way to do this, for God's sake. You'll get us both killed. Bullshit, Reacher said. They need to see us as people, not cargo. Says who? Holly snapped. Who suddenly made you the big expert?
He shrugged at her. Let me ask you a question, he said. If the boot was on the other foot, would you have left me alone in that barn? She thought about it. Of course I would have, she said. He smiled. She was probably telling the truth. He liked her for it. Okay, he said. Next time you tell me, I'm gone. No argument. She was quiet for a long moment. Good, she said. You really want to help me out. You do exactly that. He shrugged. Moved a half inch closer to her. Risky for you, he said. I get away, they might figure on just wasting you and disappearing. I'll take the risk, she said. That's what I'm paid for. So, who are they? He asked her. And what do they want? No idea, she said. She said it too quickly. He knew she knew. They want you, right? He said. Either because they want you personally, or because they want any old FBI agent and you were right there on the spot. How many FBI agents are there? Bureau has 25,000 employees, she said. Of which 10,000 are agents. Okay, he said. So they want you in particular. One out of 10,000 is too big a coincidence. This is not random. She looked away. He glanced at her. Why, Holly? He asked. She shrugged and shook her head. I don't know, she said. Too quickly. He glanced at her again. She sounded sure. But there was some big defensive edge there in her reply. I don't know, she said again. All I can figure is maybe they mistook me for somebody else from the office. Reacher laughed and turned his head toward her. His face touched her hair. You're joking, Holly Johnson, he said. You're not the type of woman gets confused with somebody else. And they watched you three weeks. Long enough to get familiar. She smiled away from him, up at the metal roof, ironically. Once seen, never forgotten, right? She said, I wish. You in any doubt about that? Reacher said. You're the best looking person I saw this week. Thanks, Reacher, she said. It's Tuesday. You first saw me Monday. Big compliment, right? But you get my drift, he said. She sat up, straight from the waist like a gymnast, and used both hands to flip her leg sideways. Propped herself on one elbow on the mattress. Hooked her hair behind her ear and looked down at him. I don't get anything about you, she said. He looked back up at her. Shrugged. You got questions, you asked them, he said. I'm all in favor of freedom of information. Okay, she said. Here's the first question. Who the hell are you? He shrugged again and smiled. Jack Reacher, he said. No middle name, 37 years and. Eight months old, unmarried, club doorman in Chicago. Bullshit, she said. Bullshit, he repeated. Which part? My name, my age, my marital status, or my occupation? Your occupation, she said. You're not a club doorman. I'm not, he said. So what am I? You're a soldier, she said. You're in the army. I am, he said. It's pretty obvious, she said. My dad is army. I've lived on bases all my life. Everybody I ever saw was in the army, right up until I was 18 years old. I know what soldiers look like. I know how they act. I was pretty sure you were one. Then you took your shirt off, and I knew for definite. Reacher grinned. Why, he said, is that a really uncouth, soldierly kind of a thing to do? Holly grinned back at him. Shook her head. Her hair came loose. She swept it back behind her ear, one finger bent like a small pale hook. That scar on your stomach, she said. Those awful stitches. That's a mash job for sure. Some field hospital somewhere took them about a minute and a half. Any civilian surgeon did stitches like that, he'd get sued for malpractice so fast he'd get dizzy. Reacher ran his finger over the lumpy skin. The stitches looked like a plan of the ties at a railroad yard. The guy was busy, he said. I thought he did pretty well, considering the circumstances. It was in Beirut. I was a long way down the priority list. I was only bleeding to death slowly. So I'm right, Holly said. You're a soldier. Reacher smiled up at her again and shook his head. I'm a doorman, he said. Like I told you, blues joint on the south side. You should try it, much better than the tourist places. She glanced between his huge scar and his face. Clamped her lips and slowly shook her head. Reacher nodded at her, like he was conceding the point. I used to be a soldier, he said. I got out, 14 months ago. What unit, she asked. Military police, he said. 
She screwed her face up in a mock grimace. The baddest of the bad, she said. Nobody likes you guys. Tell me about it, Richa said. Explains a lot of things, she said. You guys get a lot of special training. So I guess you really are qualified. You should have told me, damn it. Now I guess I have to apologize for what I said. He made no reply to that. Where were you stationed? She asked. All over the world, he said. Europe, Far East, Middle East. God sir I didn't know which way was up. Rank? She asked. Major? He said. Medals? She asked. He shrugged. Dozens of the damn things, he said. You know how it is. Theatre medals, of course, plus a silver star, two bronzes, purple heart from Beirut, campaign things from Panama and Granada and Desert Shield and Desert Storm. A silver star, she asked. What for? Beirut, he said, pulled some guys out of the bunker. And you got wounded doing that. She said, that's how you got the scar and the purple heart. I was already wounded, he said. Got wounded before I went in. I think that was what impressed them. Hero, right, she said. He smiled and shook his head. No way, he said. I wasn't feeling anything, wasn't thinking, too shocked. I didn't even know I was hit until afterward. If I'd known, I'd have fallen down in a dead faint. My intestine was hanging out. Looked really awful. It was bright pink, sort of squashy. Holly was quiet for a second. The truck droned on. Another 20 miles covered. North or south or west. Probably. How long were you in the service? She asked. All my life, he said. My old man was a marine officer, served all over. He married a French woman in Korea. I was born in Berlin. Never even saw the States until I was nine years old. Five minutes later we were in the Philippines. Round and round the world we went. Longest I was ever anywhere was four years at West Point. Then I joined up and it started all over again. Round and round the world. Where's your family now? She asked. Dead, he said. The old man died, what? Ten years ago, I guess. My mother died two years later. I buried the silver star with her. She won it for me, really. Do what you're supposed to do, she used to tell me. About a million times a day, in a thick French accent. Brothers and sisters, she said. I had a brother, he said. He died last year. I'm the last reacher on earth, far as I know. When did you muster out, she said. April last year, he said. Fourteen months ago. Why, she asked. Reacher shrugged. Just lost interest, I guess, he said. The defense cuts were happening. Made the army seem unnecessary, somehow. Like if they didn't need the biggest and the best, they didn't need me. Didn't want to be part of something small and second rate. So I left. Arrogant, or what? She laughed. So you became a doorman. She said, from a decorated major to a doorman. Isn't that kind of second rate? Wasn't like that, he said. I didn't set out to be a doorman, like it was a new career move or anything. It's only temporary. I only got to Chicago on Friday. I was planning to move on, maybe Wednesday. I was thinking about going up to Wisconsin. Supposed to be a nice place, this time of year. Friday to Wednesday, Holly said, you got a problem with commitment or something. I guess, he said. 36 years I was always where somebody else told me to be. Very structured sort of a life. I suppose I'm reacting against it. I love moving around when I feel like it. It's like a drug. Longest I've ever stayed anywhere was 10 consecutive days. Last fall, in Georgia. 10 days, out of 14 months. Apart from that, I've been on the road, more or less all the time. Making a living by working the door at clubs. She asked. That was unusual, he said. Mostly I don't work at all, just live off my savings. But I came up to Chicago with a singer, one thing led to another, I got asked to work the door at the club the guy was headed for. So what do you do if you don't work? She asked. I look at things, he said. You got to remember, I'm a 37-year-old American, but I've never really been in America much. You've been up the Empire State Building. Of course, she said. I hadn't, he said. Not before last year. You've been to the Washington Museums. Sure, she said. I hadn't, he said again. Not before last year. All that kind of stuff. 
Boston, New York, Washington, Chicago, New Orleans, Mount Rushmore, the Golden Gate, Niagara. I'm like a tourist. Like I'm catching up, right? I'm the other way around, Holly said. I like to travel overseas. Reacher shrugged. I've seen overseas, he said. Six continents. I'm going to stay here now. I've seen the States, she said. My dad traveled all the time, but we stayed here, apart from two tours to Germany. Reacher nodded, thought back to the time he'd spent in Germany, man and boy. Many years, in total. You picked up on the soccer in Europe. He asked, right, Holly said, really big deal there. We were stationed one time near Munich, right? I was just a kid, 11 maybe. They gave my father tickets to some big game in Rotterdam, Holland. European Cup, the Bayern Munich team against some English team, Aston Villa, you ever heard of them? Reacher nodded, from Birmingham, England, he said. I was stationed near a place called Oxford at one point, about an hour away. I hated the Germans, Holly said. So arrogant, so overpowering. They were so sure they were going to cream these Brits. I didn't want to go and watch it happen. But I had to, right? NATO protocol sort of a thing, would have been a big scandal if I'd refused. So we went, and the Brits creamed the Germans. The Germans were so furious. I loved it. And the Aston Villa guys were so cute. I was in love with soccer from that night on. Still am. Reacher nodded. He enjoyed watching soccer, to an extent. But you had to be exposed early and gradually. It looked very free form, but it was a very technical game. Full of hidden attractions. But he could see how a young girl could be seduced by it, long ago in Europe. A frantic night under floodlights in Rotterdam. Resentful and unwilling at first, then hypnotized by the patterns made by the white ball on the green turf. Ending up in love with the game afterward. But something was ringing a warning bell. If the 11-year-old daughter of an American serviceman had refused to go, it would have caused some kind of an embarrassment within NATO. Was that what she had said? Who was your father? He asked her. Sounds like he must have been an important sort of a guy. She turned her head away. Wouldn't answer. Reacher stared at her. Another warning bell was ringing. Holly, who the hell is your father? He asked urgently. The defensive tone that had been in her voice spread to her face. No answer. Who? Holly. Reacher asked again. She looked away from him. Spoke to the metal siding of the truck. Her voice was almost lost in the road noise. Defensive as hell. General Johnson, she said quietly. At that time, he was C in C Europe. Do you know him? Reacher stared up at her. General Johnson. Holly Johnson. Father and daughter. I've met him, he said. But that's not the point, is it? She glared at him, furious. Why? She said. What exactly is the damn point? That's the reason, he said. Your father is the most important military man in America, right? That's why you've been kidnapped, Holly, for God's sake. These guys don't want Holly Johnson, FBI agent. The whole FBI thing is incidental. These guys want General Johnson's daughter. She looked down at him like he had just slapped her hard in the face. Why? She said. Why the hell does everybody assume everything that ever happens to me is because of who my damn father is? McGraw brought Brogan with him and met Milosevic at Meg's Field Airport in Chicago. He brought the four computer-aided mug shots and the test picture of Holly Johnson. He came expecting total cooperation from the airport staff. And he got it. Three hyped-up FBI agents in the grip of fear about a colleague or a difficult proposition to handle with anything other than total cooperation. Meg's Field was a small commercial operation, right out in the lake, water on three sides, just below the 12th Street Beach, trying to make a living in the gigantic shadow of O'Hare. Their record-keeping was immaculate and their efficiency was first class. Not so they could be ready to handle FBI inquiries on the spur of the moment. But so they could keep on operating and keep on getting paid right under the nose of the world's toughest competitor. But their records and their efficiency helped McGrath. Helped him realize within about 30 seconds that he was heading up a blind alley. The Megs field staff were certain they had never seen Holly Johnson or any of the four kidnappers at any time. Certainly not on Monday, certainly not around one o'clock. They were adamant about it. 
They weren't overdoing it. They were just sure about it, with the quiet certainty of people who spend their working days being quietly sure about things, like sending small planes up into the busiest air lanes on the planet. And there were no suspicious takeoffs from Meg's field, nowhere between noon and, say, three o'clock. That was clear. The paperwork was explicit on the subject. The three agents were out of there as briskly as they had entered. The tower staff nodded to themselves and forgot all about them. Before they were even back in the cars in the small parking lot. Okay, square one, McGrath said. You guys go check out this dentist situation up in Wilmot. I've got things to do. And I've got to put in a call to Webster. They must be climbing the walls down there in D.C. 1702 miles from Megsfield the young man in the woods wanted instructions. He was a good agent, well trained, but as far as undercover work was concerned he was new and relatively inexperienced. Demand for undercover operators was always increasing. The bureau was hard put to fill all the slots. So people like him got assigned. Inexperienced people. He knew as long as he always remembered he didn't have all the answers, he'd be okay. He had no ego problem with it. He was always willing to ask for guidance. He was careful. And he was realistic. Realistic enough to know he was now in over his head. Things were turning bad in a way which made him sure they were about to explode into something much worse. How? He didn't know. It was just a feeling. But he trusted his feelings. Trusted him enough to stop and turn around before he reached his special tree. He breathed hard and changed his mind and set off strolling back the way he had come. Webster had been waiting for McGrath's call. That was clear. McGrath got him straight away, like he'd been sitting there in his big office suite just waiting for the phone to ring. Progress, Mac, Webster asked. Some, McGrath said, we know exactly what happened. We got it all on a security video in a dry cleaners store. She went in there at 12.10. Came out at 12.15. There were four guys. Three on the street, one in a car. They grabbed her. Then what? Webster asked. They were in a stolen sedan, McGrath said. Looks like they killed the owner to get it. Drove her five miles south, torched the sedan. Along with the owner in the trunk. They burned him alive. He was a dentist, name of Reuben. What they did with Holly, we don't know yet. In Washington, Harland Webster was silent for a long time. Is it worth searching the area? He asked, eventually. McGrath's turn to be quiet for a second unsure of the implications. Did Webster mean search for a hideout, or search for another body? My gut says no, he said. They must know we could search the area. My feeling is they moved her somewhere else. Maybe far away. There was silence on the line again. McGrath could hear Webster thinking. I agree with you, I guess, Webster said. They moved her out. But how, exactly? By road. By air. Not air, McGrath said. We covered commercial flights yesterday. We just hit a private field. Nothing doing. What about a helicopter? Webster said, in and out, secretly. Not in Chicago, Chief, McGrath said. Not right next door to O'Hare. More radar here than the Air Force has got. Any unauthorized choppers in and out of here, we'd know about it. Okay, Webster said, but we need to get this under control. Abduction and homicide, Mac, it's not giving me a good feeling. You figure a second stolen vehicle. Rendezvoused with the stolen sedan. Probably, McGrath said. We're checking now. Any ideas who they were? Webster said. No, McGrath told him. We got pretty good pictures off the video. Computer enhancements. We'll download them to you right away. Four guys, white, somewhere between 30 and 40, three of them kind of alike, ordinary, neat, short hair. The fourth guy is real tall. Computer says he's maybe 6'5". I figure him for the ringleader. He was the one got to her first. You got any feeling for a motive yet? Webster asked. No idea at all, McGrath said. There was silence on the line again. Okay, Webster said. You keeping it real tight up there? Tight as I can, McGrath said. Just three of us. Who are you using? Webster asked. Rogan and Milosevic, McGrath said. They any good? Webster asked. McGrath grunted. Like he would choose them if they weren't. They know Holly pretty well, he said. 
They're good enough. Moaners and groaners. Webster asked. Or solid. Like people used to be. Never heard them complain, McGrath said. About anything. They do the work. They do the hours. They don't even bitch about the pay. Webster laughed. Can we clone them? He said. The levity peaked and died within a couple of seconds. But McGrath appreciated the attempt at morale. So how you doing down there? He asked. In what respect, Mac? Webster said, serious again. The old man, McGrath said. He giving you any trouble? Which one, Mac? Webster asked. The general, McGrath said. Not yet, Webster said. He called this morning, but he was polite. That's how it goes. Parents are usually pretty calm. The first day or two, they get worked up later. General Johnson won't be any different. He may be a big shot, but people are all the same underneath, right? Right, McGrath said. Have him call me, if he wants first-hand reports. Might help his situation. Okay, Mac, thanks, Webster said. But I think we should keep this dentist thing away from everybody, just for the moment. Makes the whole deal look worse. Meantime, send me your stuff. I'll get our people working on it. And don't worry, we'll get her back. Bureau looks after its own, right? Never fails. The two bureau chiefs let the lie die into silence and hung up their phones together. A young man strolled out of the forest and came face to face with the commander. He was smart enough to throw a big salute and look nervous, but he kept it down to the sort of nervousness any grunt showed around the commander. Nothing more, nothing suspicious. He stood and waited to be spoken to. Job for you, the commander said. You're young, right, good with all this technical shit. The man nodded cautiously. I can usually puzzle stuff out, sir, he said. The commander nodded back. We got a new toy, he said. Scanner, for radio frequencies. I want a watch kept. The young man's blood froze hard. Why, sir, he asked, you think somebody's using a radio transmitter? Possibly, the commander said. I trust nobody and I suspect everybody. I can't be too careful. Not right now. Got to look after the details. You know what they say. Genius is in the details, right? The young man swallowed and nodded. So get it set up, the commander said. Make a duty rotor. Two shifts, 16 hours a day, okay. Constant vigilance is what we need right now. The commander turned away. The young man nodded and breathed out. Glanced instinctively back in the direction of his special tree and blessed his feelings. Milosevic drove Brogan north in his new truck. They detoured via the Wilmot post office so Brogan could mail his twin alimony checks. Then they went looking for the dead dentist's building. There was a local uniform waiting for them in the parking lot in back. He was unapologetic about sitting on the report from the dentist's wife. Milosevic started giving him a hard time about that, like it made the guy personally responsible for Holly Johnson's abduction. Lots of husbands disappear, the guy said. Happens all the time. This is Wilmot, right? Men are the same here as anywhere, only here they got the money to make it all happen. What can I say? Milosevic was unsympathetic. The cop had made two other errors. First, he had assumed that it was the murder of the dentist that had brought the FBI out into his jurisdiction. Second, he was more uptight about covering his own ass on the issue than he was about four killers snatching Holly Johnson right off the street. Milosevic was out of patience with the guy. But then the guy redeemed himself. What is it with people? He said, burning automobiles. Some asshole burned a car out by the lake. We got to get it moved. Residents are giving us noise. Where exactly? Milosevic asked him. The cop shrugged. He was anxious to be very precise. That turn out on the shore, he said. On Sheridan Road, just this side of Washington Park. Never saw such a thing before, not in Wilmot. Milosevic and Brogan went to check it out. They followed the cop in his shiny cruiser. He led them to the place. It wasn't a car. It was a pickup, a ten-year-old Dodge. No license plates. Doused with gasoline and pretty much totally burned out. Happened yesterday, the cop said. Spotted about 7.30 in the morning. Commuters were calling it in, on their way to work one after the other. He circled around and looked over the wreck carefully. Not local, he said. That's my guess. Why not? Milosevic asked him.
This is 10 years old, right? The guy said. Around here, there are a few pickups, but they're toys, you know. Big V8s, lots of chrome. An old thing like this, nobody would give it room on the driveway. What about gardeners? Brogan asked. Pool boys, something like that. Why would they burn it? The cop said. They needed to change it, they'd chop it in against a new one, right? Nobody burns a business asset, right? Milosevic thought about it and nodded. Okay, he said. This is ours. Federal investigation. We'll send a flatbed for it soon as we can. Meanwhile, you guard it, okay? And do it properly, for God's sake. Don't let anybody near it. Why? The cop asked. Milosevic looked at him like he was a moron. This is their truck, he said. They dumped it here and stole the Lexus for the actual heist. The Wilmot cop looked at Milosevic's agitated face and then he looked across at the burned truck. He wondered for a moment how four guys could fit across the Dodger's bench seat. But he didn't say anything. He didn't want to risk more ridicule. He just nodded. Holly was sitting up on the mattress, one knee under her chin, the injured leg straight out. Reacher was sitting up beside her, hunched forward, worried, one hand fighting the bounce of the truck and the other hand plunged into his hair. What about your mother? he asked. Was your father famous? Holly asked him back. Reacher shook his head. Hardly, he said. Guys in his unit knew who he was, I guess. So you don't know what it's like, she said. Every damn thing you do, it happens because of your father. I got straight A's in school, I went to Yale and Harvard, went to Wall Street, but it wasn't me doing it, it was this weird other person called General Johnson's daughter doing it. It's been just the same with the Bureau. Everybody assumes I made it because of my father, and ever since I got there half the people are still treating me especially nice. And the other half are still treating me especially tough just to prove how much they're not impressed. Reacher nodded. Thought about it. He was a guy who had done better than his father. Forged ahead, in the traditional way. Left the old man behind. But he'd known guys with famous parents. The sons of great soldiers. Even the grandsons. However bright they burned, their light was always lost in the glow. Okay, so it's tough, he said. And the rest of your life you can try to ignore it, but right now it needs dealing with. It opens up a whole new can of worms. She nodded, blew an exasperated sigh. Reacher glanced at her in the gloom. How long ago did you figure it out? He asked. Immediately, I guess, she said. Like I told you, it's a habit. Everybody assumes everything happens because of my father. Me too. Well, thanks for telling me so soon, Reacher said. She didn't reply to that. They lapsed into silence. The air was stifling and the heat was somehow mixing with the relentless drone of the noise. The dark and the temperature and the sound were like a thick soup inside the truck. Reacher felt like he was drowning in it. But it was the uncertainty that was doing it to him. Many times he'd traveled 30 hours at a stretch in transport planes, worse conditions than these. It was the huge new dimension of uncertainty that was unsettling him. So what about your mother? He asked her again. She shook her head. She died, she said. I was 20, in school. Some weird cancer. I'm sorry, he said. Paused, nervously. Brothers and sisters. She shook her head again. Just me, she said. He nodded, reluctantly. I was afraid of that, he said. I was kind of hoping this could be about something else, you know, maybe your mother was a judge or you had a brother or a sister who was a congressman or something. Forget it, she said. There's just me. Me and dad. This is about dad. But what about him? He said. What the hell is this supposed to achieve? Ransom. Forget about it. Your old man's a big deal. But he's just a soldier, been clawing his way up the army pay scales all his life. Faster than most guys, I agree, but I know those pay scales. I was on those scales 13 years. Didn't make me rich and they won't have made him rich. Not rich enough for anybody to be thinking about a ransom. Somebody wanted a ransom out of kidnapping somebody's daughter, there are a million people ahead of you in Chicago alone. Holly nodded. This is about influence, she said. 
He's responsible for 2 million people and $200 billion a year. Scope for influence there, right? Reacher shook his head. No, he said, that's the problem. I can't see what this is liable to achieve. He got to his knees and crawled forward along the mattresses. Hell are you doing? Holly asked him. We got to talk to them, he said. Before we get where we're going. He lifted his big fist and started pounding on the bulkhead. Hard as he could, right behind where he figured the driver's head must be. He kept on pounding until he got what he wanted took a while, several minutes. His fist got sore, but the truck lurched off the pavement and started slowing. He felt the front wheels washing into gravel. The brakes bit in. He was pressed up against the bulkhead by the momentum. Holly rolled a couple of feet along the mattress, gasped in pain as her knee twisted against the motion. Pulled off the highway, Reacher said. Middle of nowhere. This is a big mistake, Reacher, Holly said. He shrugged and took her hand and helped her into a sitting position, back against the bulkhead. Then he slid forward and put himself between her and the rear doors. He heard the three guys getting out of the cab. Doors slammed. He heard their footsteps crunching over the gravel. Two coming down the right flank, one down the left. He heard the key sliding into the lock. The handle turned. The left-hand rear door opened two inches. First thing into the truck was the muzzle of the shotgun. Beyond it, Reacher saw a meaningless sliver of sky. Bright blue, small white clouds. Could have been anywhere in the hemisphere. Second thing into the truck was a Glock 17. Then a wrist. The cuff of a cotton shirt. The Glock was rock steady. Loader. This better be good, bitch, he called. Hostile. A lot of tension in the voice. We need to talk, Reacher called back. A second Glock appeared in the narrow gap. Shaking slightly. Talk about what asshole. Loder called. Reacher listened to the stress in the guy's voice and watched the second clock trembling through its random zigzags. This isn't going to work, guys, he said. Whoever told you to do this, he isn't thinking straight. Maybe it felt like some kind of a smart move, but it's all wrong. It isn't going to achieve anything. It's just going to get you guys in a shitload of trouble. There was silence at the rear of the truck just for a second, but long enough to tell Reacher that Holly was right. Long enough to know he'd made a bad mistake. A steady Glock snapped back out of sight. The shotgun jerked, like it had just changed ownership. Reacher flung himself forward and smashed Holly down flat on the mattress. The shotgun barrel tipped upward. Reacher heard the small click of the trigger a tiny fraction before an enormous explosion. The shotgun fired into the roof. A huge blast. A hundred tiny holes appeared in the metal. A hundred tiny points of blue light. Spent shot rattled and bounced down and ricocheted around the truck like hail. Then the sound of the gun faded into the hum of temporary deafness. Reacher felt the slam of the door. The sliver of daylight cut off. He felt the rock of the vehicle as the three men climbed back into the cab. He felt the shake as the rough diesel caught then a forward lurch and a yaw to the left as the truck pulled back onto the highway. First thing Reacher heard as his hearing came back was a quiet keening as the air whistled out through the hundred pellet holes in the roof. It grew louder as the miles rolled by. A hundred high-pitched whistles, all grouped together a couple of semitones apart, fighting and warbling like some kind of demented birdsong. Insane, right, Holly said, me or them, he said. He nodded an apology. She nodded back and struggled up to a sitting position. Used both hands to straighten her knee. The holes in the roof were letting light through. Enough light that Reacher could see her face clearly. He could interpret her expression. He could see the flicker of pain. Like a blind coming down in her eyes, then snapping back up. He knelt and swept the spent pellets off the mattress. They rattled across the metal floor. Now you've got to get out, she said. You'll get yourself killed soon. The highlights in her hair flashed under the random bright illumination. I mean it, she said. Qualified or not, I can't let you stay. I know you can't, he said. He used his discarded shirt to sweep the pellets into a pile near the doors. Then he straightened the mattresses and lay back down, rocked gently with the motion, stared at the holes in the sheet metal above him. They were like a map of some distant galaxy. My father would do what it takes to get me back, Holly said.
Talking was harder than it had been before. The drone of the motor and the rumble of the road were complicated by the high-pitched whistle from the roof. A full spectrum of noise. Holly lay down next to reach her. She put her head next to his. Her hair fanned out and brushed his cheek and fell to his neck. She squirmed her hips and straightened her leg. There was still space between their bodies. The decorous V-shape was still there, but the angle was a little tighter than it had been before. But what can he do? Reacha said. Talk me through it. They're going to make some kind of demand, she said. You know, do this or do that, or we hurt your girl. She spoke slowly and there was a tremor in her voice. Reacher let his hand drop into the space between them and found hers. He took it and squeezed gently. Doesn't make any sense, he said. Think about it. What does your father do? He implements long-term policy, and he's responsible for short-term readiness. Congress and the President and the Defense Secretary thrash out the long-term policy, right? So if the joint chairman tried to stand in their way, they'd just replace him. Especially if they know he's under this kind of pressure, right? What about short-term readiness, she said. Same sort of a thing, Reacher said. He's only chairman of a committee. The individual chiefs of staff are in there, too. Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. If they're all singing a different song from what your father is reporting upward, that's not going to stay a secret for long, is it? They'll just replace him, take him out of the equation altogether. Holly turned her head, looked straight at him. Are you sure? She said. Suppose these guys are working for Iraq or something. Suppose Saddam wants Kuwait again. But he doesn't want another desert storm. So he has me kidnapped, and my father says sorry, can't be done, for all kinds of invented reasons. Reacher shrugged. The answer's right there in the words you used, he said. The reasons would be invented. Fact is, we could do Desert Storm again, if we had to. No problem. Everybody knows that. So if your father started denying it, everybody would know he was bullshitting, and everybody would know why. They'd just sideline him. The military is a tough place, Holly, no room for sentiment. If that's the strategy these guys are pursuing, they're wasting their time. It can't work. She was quiet for a long moment. Then maybe this is about revenge, she said slowly. Maybe somebody is punishing him for something in the past. Maybe I'm going to Iraq. Maybe they want to make him apologize for Desert Storm. Or Panama, or Granada, or lots of things. Reacher lay on his back and rocked with the motion. He could feel slight breaths of air stirring, because of the holes in the roof. He realized the truck was now a lot cooler, because of the new ventilation. Or because of his new mood. Too arcane, he said. You'd have to be a pretty acute analyst to blame the joint chairman for all that stuff. There's a string of more obvious targets. Higher profile people, right. The president, the defense secretary, foreign service people, field generals. If Baghdad was looking for a public humiliation, they'd pick somebody their people could identify, not some paper shuffler from the Pentagon. So what the hell is this about? Holly said. Reacher shrugged again. Ultimately, nothing, he said. They haven't thought it through properly. That's what makes them so dangerous. They're competent, but they're stupid. The truck droned on another six hours. Another 350 miles, according to Reacher's guess. The inside temperature had cooled, but Reacher wasn't trying to estimate the direction by the temperature anymore. The pellet holes in the roof had upset that calculation. He was relying on dead reckoning instead. A total of 800 miles from Chicago, he figured, and not in an easterly direction. That left a big spread of possibilities. He trawled clockwise around the map in his head. Could be in Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana. Could be in Texas, Oklahoma, the southwest corner of Kansas. Probably no farther west than that. Reacher's mental map had brown shading there, showing the eastern slopes of the mountains, and the truck wasn't laboring up any grades. Could be in Nebraska or South Dakota. Maybe he was going to pass right by Mount Rushmore, second time in his life. Could have kept on past Minneapolis, into North Dakota. 800 miles from Chicago, anywhere along a giant arc drawn across the continent. The light coming in through the pellet holes had been gone for hours when the truck slowed and steered right. 
Up a ramp, Holly stirred and turned her head, looked straight at Reacher. Questions in her eyes. Reacher shrugged back and waited. The truck paused and swung a right, cruised down a straight road, then hung a left, a right, and continued on straight, slower. Reacher sat up and found his shirt, shrugged himself into it. Holly sat up. Another hideout, she said. This is a well-planned operation, Reacher. This time it was a horse farm. The truck bumped down a long track and turned. Backed up, Reacher heard one of the guys getting out. His door slammed. The truck lurched backward into another building. Reacher heard the exhaust noise beat against the walls. Holly smelled horse smell. The engine died. The other two guys got out. Reacher heard the three of them grouping at the rear of the truck. Their key slid into the lock. The door cracked open. The shotgun poked in through the gap. This time, not pointing upward. Pointing level. Out, Loder called. The bitch first. On its own. Holly froze. Then she shrugged at Reacher and slid across the mattresses. The door snapped wide open and two pairs of hands seized her and dragged her out. The driver moved into view, aiming the shotgun straight in at Reacher. His finger was tight on the trigger. Do something, asshole, he said. Please, just give me a damn excuse. Reacher stared at him, waited five long minutes. Then the shotgun jabbed forward. The Glock appeared next to it. Loder gestured. Reacher moved slowly forward toward the two muzzles. Loder leaned in and snapped a handcuff onto his wrist. Looped the chain into the free half and locked it. Used the chain to drag him out of the truck by the arm. They were in a horse barn. It was a wooden structure. Much smaller than the cow barn at the previous location. Much older. It came from a different generation of agriculture. There were two rows of stalls flanking an aisle. The floor was some kind of cobbled stone. Green with moss. The central aisle was wide enough for horses, but not wide enough for the truck. It was back just inside the door. Reacher saw a frame of sky around the rear of the vehicle. A big, dark sky. Could have been anywhere. He was led like a horse down the cobbled aisle. Loder was holding the chain. Stevie was walking sideways next to Reacher. His Glock was jammed high up against Reacher's temple. The driver was following, with the shotgun pressed hard into Reacher's kidney. It bumped with every step. They stopped at the end stall, farthest from the door. Holly was chained up in the space opposite. She was wearing a handcuff, right wrist, chain looped through the spare half into an iron ring bolted into the back wall of the stall. The two guys with the guns fanned out in a loose arc and Loder shoved Reacher into his stall. Opened the cuff with the key. Looped the chain through the iron ring bolted into the timber on the back wall, looped it again, twice, and relocked it into the cuff. He pulled at it and shook it to confirm it was secure. Mattresses, Reacher said. Bring us the mattresses out of the truck. Loder shook his head, but the driver smiled and nodded. Okay, he said. Good idea, asshole. He stepped up inside and dragged the queen size out. Struggled with it all the way down the aisle and flopped it into Holly's stall. Kicked it straight. The bitch gets one, he said. You don't. He started laughing and the other two joined in. They strolled away down the aisle. The driver pulled the truck forward out of the barn and the heavy doors creaked shut behind it. Reacher heard a heavy crossbeam slamming down into its retaining brackets on the outside and the rattle of another chain and a padlock. He glanced across at Holly. Then he looked down at the damp stone floor. Reacher was squatted down, jammed into the far angle of the stall's wooden walls. He was waiting for the three guys to come back with dinner. They arrived after an hour. With one Glock and the shotgun. And one metal meston. Stevie walked in with it. The driver took it from him and handed it to Holly. He stood there leering at her for a second and then turned to face Reacher. Pointed the shotgun at him. Bitch eats, he said. You don't. Reacher didn't get up. He just shrugged through the gloom. That's a loss I can just about survive, he said. Nobody replied to that. They just strolled back out. Pushed the heavy wooden doors shut. Dropped the crossbeam into place and chained it up. Reacher listened to their footsteps fade away and turned to Holly. What is it? he asked. She shrugged across the distance at him. Some sort of a thin stew, she said. Or a thick soup, I guess. One or the other. You want some? They give you a fork? he asked. No, a spoon, she said. 
Shit, he said. Can't do anything with a damn spoon. You want some? She asked again. Can you reach? He said. She spent some time eating, then she stretched out. One arm tight against the chain, the other pushing the meston across the floor. Then she swiveled and used her good foot to slide the tin farther across the stone. Reacher slid forward, feet first, as far as his chain would let him go. He figured if he could stretch far enough, he could hook his foot around the tin and drag it in toward him. But it was hopeless. He was 6'5", and his arms were about the longest the army tailors had ever seen, but even so he came up four feet short. He and Holly were stretched out in a perfect straight line, as near together as their chains would let them get, but the Meston was still way out of his reach. Forget it, he said. Get it back while you can. She hooked her own foot around the tin and pulled it back. Sorry, she said. You're going to be hungry. I'll survive, he said. Probably awful, anyway. Right, she said. It's shit. Tastes like dog food. Reacher stared through the dark at her. He was suddenly worried. Holly lay down apologetically on her mattress and calmly went to sleep, but Reacher stayed awake. Not because of the stone floor. It was cold and damp, and hard. The cobblestones were wickedly lumpy. But that was not the reason. He was waiting for something. He was ticking off the minutes in his head, and he was waiting. His guess was it would be about three hours, maybe four. Way into the small hours, when resistance is low and patience runs out. A long wait, the 13,761st night of his life, way down there in the bottom third of the scale, lying awake and waiting for something to happen. Something bad. Something he maybe had no chance of preventing. It was coming. He was certain of that. He'd seen the signs. He lay and waited for it, ticking off the minutes. Three hours, maybe four. It happened after three hours and thirty-four minutes. The nameless driver came back into the barn. Wide awake and alone, Reacher heard his soft footsteps on the track outside. He heard the rattle of the padlock and the chain. He heard him lift the heavy crossbar out of its brackets. The barn door opened. A bar of bright moonlight fell across the floor. The driver stepped through it. Reacher saw a flash of his pink pig's face. The guy hurried down the aisle. No weapon in his hand. I'm watching you, Reacher said, quietly. You back off, or you're a dead man. The guy stopped opposite. He wasn't a complete moron. He stayed well out of range. His bright eyes traveled up from the handcuff on Reach's wrist, along the chain, and rested on the iron ring in the wall. Then he smiled. You watch if you want to, he said. I don't mind an audience. And you might learn something. Holly stirred and woke up. Raised her head and glanced around, blinking in the dark. What's going on, she said. The driver turned to her. Reacher couldn't see his face. It was turned away, but he could see Holly's. We're going to have us a little fun, bitch, the driver said. Just you and me, with your asshole friend here, watching and learning. He put his hands down to his waist and unbuckled his belt. Holly stared at him, started to sit up. Got to be joking, she said. You come near me, I'll kill you. You wouldn't do that, the driver said. Now would you, after I gave you a mattress and all, just so we could be comfortable while we're doing it. Reacher stood up in his stall. His chain clanked loudly in the silent night. I'll kill you, he called. You touch her, you're a dead man. He said it once, and then he said it again. But it was like the guy wasn't hearing him. Like he was deaf. Reacher was hit with a clang of fear. If the guy wasn't going to listen to him, there was nothing he could do. He shook his chain. It rattled loudly through the silence of the night. It had no effect. The guy was just ignoring him. You come near me, I'll kill you, Holly said again. Her leg was slowing her down. She was trapped in an awkward struggle to stand up. The driver darted into her stall. Raised his foot and stamped it down on her knee. She screamed in agony and collapsed and curled into a ball. You do what I tell you, bitch, the driver said exactly what I tell you, or you'll never walk again. Holly's scream died into a sob. The driver pulled his foot back and carefully kicked her knee like he was aiming for a field goal right at the end of the last quarter. She screamed again. You're a dead man, Reacher yelled. The driver turned around and faced him. Smiled a wide smile. You keep your mouth tight shut, he said. One more squeak out of you, it'll be harder on the bitch, okay? 
The ends of his belt were hanging down. He balled his fists and propped them on his hips. His big vivid face was glowing. His hair was bushed up like he'd just washed it and combed it back. He turned his head and spoke to Holly over his shoulder. You wearing anything under that suit? He asked her. Holly didn't speak. Silence in the barn. The guy turned to face her. Reacher saw her tracking his movements. I asked you a question, bitch, he said. You want another kick? She didn't reply. She was breathing hard, fighting the pain. The driver unzipped his pants. The sound of the zip was loud. It fought with the rasping of three people breathing hard. You see this? He asked. You know what this is? Sort of, Holly muttered. It looks a little like a penis, only smaller. He stared at her, blankly. Then he bellowed in rage and rushed into her stall, swinging his foot. Holly dodged away. His short wide leg swung and connected with nothing. He staggered off balance. Holly's eyes narrowed in a gleam of triumph. She dodged back and smashed her elbow into his stomach. She did it right. Used his own momentum against him, used all her weight like she wanted to punch his spine right out through his back. Caught him with a solid blow. The guy gasped and spun away. Reacher whooped in admiration. And relief. He thought, couldn't have done it better myself, kid. The guy was heaving. Reacher saw his face, crumpled in pain. Holly was snarling in triumph. She scrambled on one knee after him. Going for his groin. Reacher willed her on. She launched herself at him. The guy turned and took it on the thigh. Holly had planned for that. It left his throat open to her elbow. Reacher saw it. Holly saw it. She lined it up. The killing blow. A vicious arcing curve. It was going to rip his head off. She swung it in. Then her chain snapped tight and stopped her short. It clanked hard against the iron ring and jerked her backward. Reacher's grin froze on his face. The guy staggered out of range. Stooped and panted and caught his breath. Then he straightened up and hitched his belt higher. Holly faced him, one-handed. Her chain was tight against the wall, vibrating with the tension she had on it. I like a fighter, the guy gasped. Makes it more interesting for me. But make sure you save yourself some energy for later. I don't want you just lying there. Holly glared at him, breathing hard. Crackling with aggression. But she was one-handed. The guy stepped in again and she swung a stinging punch. Fast and low. He crowded left and blocked it. She couldn't deliver the follow-up. Her other arm was pinned back. He raised his foot and kicked for her stomach. She arched around it. He kicked out again and stumbled straight into an elbow, hard against his ear. It was the wrong elbow, with no force behind it because of her impossible position. A poor blow. It left her off balance. The driver stepped close and kicked her in the gut. She went down. He kicked out again and caught her knee. Reacher heard it crunch. She screamed in agony collapsed on the mattress. The driver breathed fast and stood there. I asked you a damn question, he said. Holly was deathly white and trembling. She was writhing around on the mattress, one arm pinned behind her, gasping with the pain. Reacher saw her face, flashing through the bar of bright moonlight. I'm waiting, bitch, the guy said. Reacher saw her face again. Saw she was beaten. The fight was out of her. Want another kicking, the driver said. There was silence in the barn again. I'm waiting for an answer, the guy said. Reacher stared over, waiting. There was still silence. Just the rasping of three people breathing hard in the quiet. Then Holly spoke. What was the question, she said quietly. The guy smiled down at her. You wearing anything under that suit? He said. Holly nodded. Didn't speak. Okay, what, the guy said to her. Underwear, she said, quietly. The guy cupped a hand behind his ear. Can't hear you, bitch, he said. I'm wearing underwear, you bastard, she said, louder. The guy shook his head. Bad name, he said. I'm going to need an apology for that. Screw you, Holly said. I'll kick you again, the guy said. In the knee, I do that, you'll never walk without a stick, the whole rest of your life, you bitch. Holly looked away. Your choice, bitch, the guy said. He raised his foot. Holly stared down at her mattress. Okay, I apologize, she said. I'm sorry. The guy nodded, happily. Describe your underwear to me, he said. Lots of detail. She shrugged, turned her face away and spoke to the wooden wall. Bra and pants, she said. Victoria's secret. Dark peach. Skimpy, the driver asked. 
she shrugged again, miserably, like she knew for sure what the next question was going to be. I guess, she said. Want to show it to me, the guy said. No, she said. The driver took a step closer. So you do want another kicking, he said. She didn't speak. The guy cupped his hand behind his ear again. Can't hear you, bitch, he said. What was the question? Holly muttered. You want another kicking, the guy said. Holly shook her head. No, she said again. Okay, he said. Show me your underwear, and you won't get one. He raised his foot. Holly raised her hand. It went to the top button on her suit. Reacher watched her. There were five buttons down the front of the suit. Reacher willed her to undo each of them slowly and rhythmically. He needed her to do that. It was vital. Slowly and rhythmically, Holly, he pleaded silently. He gripped his chain with both hands. Four feet from where it looped into the iron ring on the back wall. He tightened his hands around it. She undid the top button. Reacher counted, one. The driver leered down. Her hand slid to the next button. Reacher tightened his grip again. She undid the second button. Reacher counted, two. Her hand slid down to the third button. Reacher turned square on to face the rear wall of his stall and took a deep breath. Turned his head and watched over his shoulder. Holly undid the third button. Her breast swelled out. Dark peach brassier, skimpy and lacy. The driver shuffled from foot to foot. Reacher counted, three. He exhaled right from the bottom of his lungs. Holly's hand slid down to the fourth button. Reacher took a deep breath, the deepest breath of his life. He tightened his hold on the chain until his knuckles shone white. Holly undid the fourth button. Reacher counted, four. Her hand slid down, paused a beat, waited, undid the fifth button. Her suit fell open. The driver leered down and made a small sound. Reacher jerked back and smashed his foot into the wall, right under the iron ring. He smashed his weight backward against the chain, 220 pounds of coiled fury exploding against the force of his kick. Splinters of damp wood burst out of the wall. The old planks shattered. The bolts tore right out of the timber. Reacher was hurled backward. He swarmed up to his feet, his chain whipping and flailing angrily behind him. 5. He screamed. He seized the driver by the arm and hurled him into his stall. Threw him against the back wall. The guy smashed into it and hung like a broken doll. He staggered forward and Reacher kicked him in the stomach. The guy jackknifed in the air, feet right off the ground, and smashed flat on his face on the cobblestones. Reacher doubled his chain and swung it through the air. Aimed the lethal length at the guy's head like a giant metal whip. The iron ring centrifuge out like an old medieval weapon. But at the last second Reacher changed his mind. Wrenched the chain out of its trajectory and let it smash and spark into the stones on the floor. He grabbed the driver, one hand on his collar and one hand in his hair. Lifted him bodily across the aisle to Holly's mattress. Jammed his ugly face down into the softness and leaned on him until he suffocated. The guy bucked and thrashed, but Reacher just planted a giant hand flat on the back of his skull and waited patiently until he died. Holly was staring at the corpse and Reacher was sitting next to her, panting. He was spent and limp from the explosive force of tearing the iron ring out of the wall. It felt like a lifetime of physical effort had gone into one split second. A lifetime supply of adrenaline was boiling through him. The clock inside his head had stopped. He had no idea how long they had been sitting there. He shook himself and staggered to his feet. Dragged the body away and left it in the aisle, up near the open door. Then he wandered back and squatted next to Holly. His fingers were bruised from his desperate grip on the chain, but he forced them to be delicate. He did up all her buttons, one by one, right to the top. She was taking quick short breaths. Then she flung her arms round his neck and held on tight. Her breathing sucked and blew against his shirt. They held each other for a long moment. He felt the fury drain out of her. They let each other go and sat side by side. On the mattress, staring into the gloom. She turned to him and put her small hand lightly on top of his. Now I guess I owe you, she said. My pleasure, Reacher said. Hey, believe me, I needed help, she said quietly. I've been fooling myself. He flipped his hand over and closed it around hers. Bullshit, Holly, he said, gently. Time to time, we all need help. Don't feel bad about it. 
If you were fit, you'd have slaughtered him. I could see that. One arm and one leg, you were nearly there. It's just your knee. Pain like that, you've got no chance. Believe me, I know what it's like. After the Beirut thing, I couldn't have taken candy from a baby, best part of a year. She smiled a slight smile and squeezed his hand. The clock inside his head started up again. Getting close to dawn. 7.20 Wednesday morning East Coast time, General Johnson left the Pentagon. He was out of uniform, dressed in a lightweight business suit, and he walked. It was his preferred method of getting around. It was a hot morning in Washington, and already humid, but he stepped out at a steady speed, arms swinging loosely through a small arc, head up, breathing hard. He walked north through the dust on the shoulder of George Washington Boulevard, along the edge of the Great Cemetery on his left, through Lady Bird Johnson Park, and across the Arlington Memorial Bridge. Then he walked clockwise around the Lincoln Memorial, past the Vietnam Wall, and turned right along Constitution Avenue, the reflecting pool on his right, the Washington Monument up ahead. He walked past the National Museum of American History, past the National Museum of Natural History, and turned left onto 9th Street. Exactly three and a half miles, on a glorious morning, an hour's brisk walk through one of the world's great capital cities, past landmarks the world's tourists flock to photograph. And he saw absolutely nothing at all except the dull mist of worry hanging just in front of his eyes. He crossed Pennsylvania Avenue and entered the Hoover Building through the main doors. Laid his hands palms down on the reception counter. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he said to see the director. His hands left two palm-shaped patches of dampness on the laminate. The agent who came down to show him upstairs noticed them. Johnson was silent in the elevator. Harland Webster was waiting for him at the door to his private suite. Johnson nodded to him, didn't speak. Webster stood aside and gestured him into the inner office. It was dark, there was a lot of mahogany paneling, and the blinds were closed. Johnson sat down in a leather chair and Webster walked around him to his desk. I don't want to get in your way, Johnson said. He looked at Webster. Webster worked for a moment, decoding that sentence. Then he nodded, cautiously. You spoke with the president. He asked. Johnson nodded. You understand it's appropriate for me to do so, he asked. Naturally, Webster said. Situation like this, nobody should worry about protocol. You call him or go see him. I went to see him, Johnson said. Several times. I had several long conversations with him. Webster thought, face to face. Several long conversations. Worse than I thought, but understandable. And, he asked. Johnson shrugged. He told me he'd placed you in personal command, he said. Webster nodded. Kidnapping, he said. It's bureau territory, whoever the victim is. Johnson nodded, slowly. I accept that, he said. For now, but you're anxious, Webster said. Believe me, General, we're all anxious. Johnson nodded again, and then he asked the question he'd walked three and a half miles to ask. Any progress, he said. Webster shrugged. We're into the second full day, he said. I don't like that at all. He lapsed into silence. The second full day of a kidnap is a kind of threshold. Any early chance of a resolution is gone. The situation starts to harden up. It starts to become a long, intractable set piece. The danger to the victim increases. The best time to clear up a kidnap is the first day. The second day, the process gets tougher. The chances get smaller. Any progress? Johnson asked again. Webster looked away. The second day is when the kidnappers start to communicate. That had always been the Bureau's experience. The second day, sick and frustrated about missing your first and best chance, you sit around, hoping desperately the guys will call. If they don't call on the second day, chances are they aren't going to call at all. Anything I can do? Johnson asked. Webster nodded. You can give me a reason, he said. Who would threaten you like this? Johnson shook his head. He had been asking himself the same question since Monday night. Nobody, he said. You should tell me, Webster said. Anything secret, anything hidden, better you tell me right now. It's important, for Holly's sake. I know that, Johnson said. But there's nothing, nothing at all. Webster nodded. He believed him, because he knew it was true. He had reviewed the whole of Johnson's bureau file. It was a weighty document. 
It started on page one with brief biographies of his maternal great-grandparents. They had come from a small European principality which no longer existed. Will Holly be okay? Johnson asked quietly. The recent file pages recounted the death of Johnson's wife. A surprise, a vicious cancer, no more than six weeks, beginning to end. Covert psychiatric opinion commissioned by the Bureau had predicted the old guy would hold up because of his daughter. It had proven to be a correct diagnosis. But if he lost her too, you didn't need to be a psychiatrist to know he wouldn't handle it well. Webster nodded again and put some conviction into his voice. She'll be fine, he said. So what have we got so far? Johnson asked. Four guys, Webster said. We've got their pickup truck. They abandoned it prior to the snatch. Burned it and left it. We found it north of Chicago. It's being airlifted down here to Quantico, right now. Our people will go over it. For clues, Johnson said, even though it burned. Webster shrugged. Burning is pretty dumb, he said. It doesn't really obscure much. Not from our people, anyway. We'll use that pickup to find them. And then what? Johnson asked. Webster shrugged again. Then we'll go get your daughter back, he said. Our hostage rescue team is standing by. Fifty guys, the best in the world at this kind of thing. Waiting right by their choppers. We'll go get her, and we'll tidy up the guys who grabbed her. There was a short silence in the dark quiet room. Tidy them up, Johnson said. What does that mean? Webster glanced around his own office and lowered his voice. 36 years of habit. Policy, he said. A major DC. Case like this. No publicity. No media access. We can't allow it. This sort of thing gets on TV. Every nut in the country is going to be trying it. So we go in quietly. Some weapons will get discharged. Inevitable in a situation like this. A little collateral damage here and there. Johnson nodded slowly. You're going to execute them? He asked, vaguely. Webster just looked at him, neutrally. Bureau psychiatrists had suggested to him the anticipation of deadly revenge could help sustain self-control, especially with people accustomed to direct action, like other agents, or soldiers. Policy, he said again. My policy. And like the man says, I've got personal command. The charred pickup was lifted onto an aluminum platform and secured with nylon ropes. An Air Force Chinook hammered over from the military compound at O'Hare and hovered above it, its downdraft whipping the lake into a frenzy. It winched its chain down and eased the pickup into the air. Swung around over the lake and dipped its nose and roared back west to O'Hare. Set its load down right in front of the open nose of a galaxy transport. Air Force ground crew winched the platform inside. The cargo door closed on it and four minutes later the galaxy was taxiing. Four minutes later again it was in the air, groaning east toward Washington. Four hours after that, it was roaring over the capital, heading for Andrews Air Force Base. As it landed, another borrowed Chinook took off and waited in mid-air. The galaxy taxied to its apron and the pickup was winched out. The Chinook swooped down and swung it into the air. Flew it south, following I-95 into Virginia, 40 miles, all the way to Quantico. The Chinook set it down gently on the tarmac, right outside the vehicle lab. Bureau techs ran out, white coats flapping in the fierce downdraft, and dragged the platform in through the roller door. They winched the wreck off the platform and pulled it into the center of the large shed. They rolled arc lights into a rough circle around it and lit them up. Then they stood there for a second, looking exactly like a team of pathologists getting ready to go to work on a corpse. General Johnson retraced his steps exactly. He made it down 9th Street, past natural history, past American history, his mouth forced into a tense rigid oval, breathing hard. He walked the length of the reflecting pool with his throat clamping and gagging. He swung left onto Constitution Avenue and made it as far as the Vietnam Wall. Then he stopped. There was a fair crowd, stunned and quiet, as always. He looked at them. He looked at himself in the black granite. He didn't stand out. He was in a lightweight gray suit. It was okay. So he let his vision blur with his tears and he moved forward and turned and sat against the base of the wall.
sobbing and crying with his back pressed against the golden names of boys who had died 30 years ago. Reacher balled his loose chain into his hand and slipped out of the barn into the pre-dawn twilight. He walked 20 paces and stopped. Freedom. The night air was soft and infinite around him. He was unconfined, but he had no idea where he was. The barn stood alone, isolated 50 yards from a clutch of farm buildings of similar old vintage. There was a house, and a couple of small sheds, and an open structure with a new pickup parked in it. Next to the pickup was a tractor. Next to the tractor, ghostly white in the moonlight, was the truck. Reacher walked over the rocky track toward it. The front doors were locked. The rear doors were locked. He ran back to the horse barn and searched through the dead driver's pockets. Nothing except the padlock key from the barn door. No keys to the truck. He ran back, squeezing the massive chain to keep it from making a sound, past the motor barn, and looked at the house. Walked right around it, the front door was locked tight. The back door was locked tight. And there was a dog behind it. Reacher heard it move in its sleep. He heard a low, sleepy growl. He walked away. He stood on the track, halfway back to the horse barn, and looked around. He trained his eyes on the indistinct horizon and turned a full circle in the dark. Some kind of a huge, empty landscape. Flat, endless, no discernible features. The damp night smell of a million acres of something growing. A pale streak of dawn in the east. He shrugged and ducked back inside. Holly raised herself on one elbow and looked a question at him. Problems, he said. The handcuff keys are in the house. So are the truck keys. I can't go in for them because there's a dog in there. It's going to bark and wake everybody up. There's more than the two others in there. This is some kind of a working farm. There's a pickup and a tractor. Could be four or five armed men in there. When that damn dog barks, I've had it. And it's nearly daylight. Problems, Holly said. Right, he said. We can't get at a vehicle, and we can't just walk away, because you're chained up and you can't walk and we're about a million miles from anywhere, anyway. Where are we? She asked. He shrugged. No idea, he said. I want to see, she said. I want to see outside. I'm sick of being closed in. Can't you get this chain off? Reacher ducked behind her and looked at the iron ring in her wall. The timber looked a little better than his had been. Closer grained. He shook the ring and he knew it was hopeless. She nodded, reluctantly. We wait, she said. We wait for a better chance. He hurried back to the middle stalls and checked the walls, low down, where it was dampest and the siding was made from the longest boards. He tapped and kicked at them. Chose one particular place and pressed hard with his foot. The board gave slightly and opened a gap against its rusty nail. He worked the gap and sprung the next board, and the next, until he had a flap which would open tall enough to crawl through. Then he ducked back into the center aisle and piled the loose end of his chain onto the dead driver's stomach. Fished in the trouser pocket and pulled out the padlock key. Held it in his teeth. Bent down and picked up the body and the chain together. Carried it out through the open door. He carried it about 25 yards away from the house. Then he rested the body on its feet, supporting it by the shoulders, like he was dancing with a drunken partner. Ducked forward and jacked it up onto his shoulder. Caught the chain with one hand and walked away down the track. He walked fast for 20 minutes. More than a mile. Along the track to a road. Turned left down the road and out into the empty countryside. It was horse country. Railed paddocks ran left and right beside the road. Endless flat grassland, cool and damp in the last of the night. Occasional trees looming through the dark. A narrow, straight, lumpy road surface. He walked down the center of the road. Then he ducked onto the grassy shoulder and found a ditch. It ran along the base of the paddock rail. He turned a complete circle, with the dead driver windmilling on his shoulder. He could see nothing. He was more than a mile from the farm and he could have been more than a hundred from the next one. He bent over and dropped the body into the ditch. It flopped down through the long grass and landed face down in mud. Reacher turned and ran the mile back to the farm. The streak of dawn was lightening the sky. He turned into the rough track. There were lights in the windows of the farmhouse. He sprinted for the barn. Pushed the heavy wooden doors closed from the outside. 
lifted the crossbeam into its supports and locked it in place with the padlock key. Ran back to the track and hurled the key far into the field. Wednesday was flaming up over the horizon. He sprinted for the far side of the barn and found the gap he'd sprung in the siding. Pushed his chain in ahead of him. Squeezed his shoulders through and forced his way back inside. Pulled the boards back flush with the old timbers, best as he could. Then he came back into the aisle and stood bent over, breathing hard. All done, he said. They'll never find him. He scooped up the metal meston with the cold remains of the soup in it. Scratched around in his stall for the fallen bolts. He gathered as many wood splinters as he could find. Sopped them around in the cold soup and forced them back into the ragged bolt holes. He walked over to Holly's stall and put the tin back on the ground. Kept the spoon. He assembled the bolts through the holes in the base of the iron ring, hanging there off his length of chain. Forced them home among the sticky splinters. Used the back of the spoon to press them firmly in. He ran the chain through the loop until it was hanging straight down and resting on the stone floor. Minimum stress on the fragile assembly. He tossed the spoon back to Holly. She caught it one-handed and put it back in the tin. Then he ducked down and listened through the boards. The dog was outside. He could hear it snuffling. Then he heard people, footsteps on the track. They ran to the doors of the barn. They shook and rattled the crossbeam. Retreated. There was shouting. They were calling a name, over and over again. The crack around the barn door was lighting up with morning. The timbers of the barn were creaking as the sun flooded over the horizon and warmed them through. The footsteps ran back to the barn. The padlock rattled and the chain came off. The crossbeam thumped to the ground. The door groaned open. Loder stepped inside. He had the glock in his hand and strain showing in his face. He stood just inside the door. His eyes were flicking back and forth between Reacher and Holly. The strain in his face was edged by anger. Some kind of a cold light in his eyes. Then the jumpy guy stepped in behind him. Stevie. He was carrying the driver's shotgun. And smiling. He crowded past Loder and ran down the central cobbled aisle. Raised the shotgun and pointed it straight at Reacher. Loder started after him. Stevie crunched around into the chamber. Reacher shifted a foot to his left, so the iron ring was hidden from view behind him. What's the problem? He asked. You are, asshole, Loder said. Situation has changed. We're a man short, so you just became one person too many. Reacher was on his way to the floor as Stevie pulled the trigger. He landed flat on the hard cobbles and hurled himself forward as the shotgun boomed and the stool blew apart. The air was instantly thick with splinters of damp wood and the stink of gunpowder. The plank holding the iron ring fell out of the shattered wall and the chain clattered to the floor. Reacher rolled over and glanced up. Stevie lifted the shotgun vertical and crunched another round into the chamber. Swung the barrel down and aimed again. Wait. Holly screamed. Stevie glanced at her. Impossible not to. Don't be a damn fool, she yelled. Hell are you doing? You don't have the time for this. Loder turned to face her. He's run, right, she said. Your driver, is that what happened? He bailed out and ran for it, right. So you need to get going. You don't have time for this. Loder stared at her. Right now you're ahead of the game, Holly said urgently. But you shoot this guy, you got the local cops a half hour behind you. You need to get going. Reacher gasped up at her from the floor. She was magnificent. She was sucking all their attention her way. She was saving his life. Two of you, two of us, she said urgently. You can handle it, right? There was silence. Dust and powder drifted in the air. Then Loder stepped back, covering them both with his automatic. Reacher watched the disappointment on Stevie's face. He stood slowly and pulled the chain clear of the wreckage. The iron ring fell out of the smashed wood and clanked on the stones. Bitch is right, Loder said. We can handle it. He nodded to Stevie. Stevie ran for the door and Loder turned and pulled his key and unlocked Holly's wrist. Dropped her cuff on her mattress. The weight of the chain pulled it back toward the wall. It pulled off the edge of the mattress and slid onto the cobblestones with a loud metallic sound. Okay, asshole, real quick, Loder said. Before I change my mind. Reacher looped his chain into his hand ducked down and picked Holly up, under her knees and shoulders. 
They heard the truck start up. It slewed backward into the entrance. Jam to a stop. Reacha ran Holly to the truck. Laid her down inside. Climbed in after her. Loder slammed the doors and shut them into darkness. Now I guess I owe you. Reacha said quietly. Holly just waved it away. An embarrassed little gesture. Reacha stared at her. He liked her. Liked her face. He gazed at it. Recalled it white and disgusted as the driver taunted her. Saw the smooth swell of her breasts under his filthy drooling gaze. Then the picture changed to Stevie smiling and shooting at him, chained to the wall. Then he heard Loda say, the situation has changed. Everything had changed. He had changed. He lay and felt the old anger inside him grinding like gears. Cold, implacable anger. Uncontrollable. They had made a mistake. They had changed him from a spectator into an enemy. A bad mistake to make. They had pushed open the forbidden door, not knowing what would come bursting back out at them. He lay there and felt like a ticking bomb they were carrying deep into the heart of their territory. He felt the flood of anger, and thrilled with it, and savored it, and stored it up. Now there was only one mattress inside the truck. It was only three feet wide. And Stevie was a very erratic driver. Reacher and Holly were lying down, pressed tight together. Reach's left wrist still had the cuff and the chain locked onto it. His right arm was around Holly's shoulders. He was holding her tight. Tighter than he really needed to. How much farther? She asked. We'll be there before nightfall, he said, quietly. They didn't bring your chain. No more overnight stops. She was silent for a moment. I don't know if I'm glad or not, she said. I hate this truck, but I don't know if I want to actually arrive anywhere. Reacher nodded. It reduces our chances, he said. Rule of thumb is escape while you're on the move. It gets much harder after that. The motion of the truck indicated they were on a highway. But either the terrain was different, or Stevie couldn't handle the truck, or both, because they were swaying violently. The guy was swinging late into turns and jamming the vehicle from side to side, like he was having a struggle staying between the lane markers. Holly was getting thrown against Reach's side. He pulled her closer and held her tighter. She snuggled in close, instinctively. He felt her hesitate, like she realized she'd acted without thinking, then he felt her decide not to pull away again. You feel okay? She asked him. You killed a man. He was quiet for a long moment. He wasn't the first, he said. And I just decided he won't be the last. She turned her head to speak at the same time he did. The truck swayed violently to the left. Their lips were an inch apart. The truck swayed again. They kissed. At first it was light and tentative. Reacher felt the new soft lips on his, and the unfamiliar new taste and smell and feel. Then they kissed harder. Then the truck started hammering through a series of sharp curves, and they forgot all about kissing and just held on tight, trying not to be thrown right off the mattress onto the ridged metal floor. Brogan was the guy who made the breakthrough in Chicago. He was the third guy that morning to walk past the can of white paint out there on the abandoned industrial lot, but he was the first to realize its significance. The truck they stole was white, Brogan said. Some kind of ID on the side. They painted over it. Got to be that way. The can was right there, with a brush, about ten feet from the Lexus. Stands to reason they would park the Lexus right next to the truck, right? Therefore the paint can was next to where the truck had been. What sort of paint? McGrath asked. Ordinary household paint, Brogan said. A quart can. Two inch brush. Price tag still on it, from a hardware store. And there are fingerprints in the splashes on the handle. McGrath nodded and smiled. Okay, he said. Go to work. Brogan took the computer aided mugshots with him to the hardware store named on the paintbrush handle. It was a cramped, family owned place, 200 yards from the abandoned lot. The counter was attended by a stout old woman with a mind like a steel trap. Straight away she identified the picture of the guy the video had caught at the wheel of the Lexus. She said the paint and the brush had been purchased by him about 10 o'clock Monday morning. To prove it, she rattled open an ancient drawer and pulled out Monday's register roll. 7.98 for the paint, 5.98 for the brush, plus tax, right there on the roll. He paid cash, she said. You got a video system in here. 
Rogan asked her. No, she said. Doesn't your insurance company say you got to? He asked. A stout old woman just smiled. We're not insured, she said. Then she leaned under the counter and came up with a shotgun. Not by no insurance company, anyway, she said. Rogan looked at the weapon. He was pretty sure the barrel was way too short for the piece to be legal. But he wasn't about to start worrying over such a thing. Not right then. Okay, he said. You take care now. More than 7 million people in the Chicago area, something like 10 million road vehicles, but only one white truck had been reported stolen in the 24-hour period between Sunday and Monday. It was a white Ford Econoline, owned and operated by a Southside electrician. His insurance company made him empty the truck at night, and store his stock and tools inside his shop. Anything left inside the truck was not covered. That was the rule. It was an irksome rule, but on Monday morning when the guy came out to load up and the truck was gone, it started to look like a rule which made a whole lot of sense. He had reported the theft to the insurance broker and the police, and he was not expecting to hear much more about it. So he was duly impressed when two FBI agents turned up, 48 hours later, asking all kinds of urgent questions. Okay, McGrath said, we know what we're looking for. White E. Connoline, new paint on the sides. We've got the plates. Now we need to know where to look. Ideas. Coming up on 48 hours, Brogan said. Assume an average speed of 55. That would make the max range somewhere more than 2,600 miles. That's effectively anywhere on the North American continent, for God's sake. Too pessimistic, Milosevic said. They probably stopped nights. Call it six hours driving time on Monday, maybe ten on Tuesday, maybe four so far today, total of twenty hours, that's a maximum range of eleven hundred miles. Needle in a haystack, Brogan said. McGraw shrugged. So let's find the haystack, he said. Then we'll go look for the needle. Call it fifteen hundred maximum. What does that look like? Brogan pulled a road atlas from the stack of reference material on the table. He opened it up to the early section where the whole country was shown all at once, all the states splatted over one page in a colorful mosaic. He checked the scale and traced his fingernail in a circle. That's anywhere shy of California, he said. Half of Washington state, half of Oregon, none of California and absolutely all of everywhere else. Somewhere around a zillion square miles. There was a depressed silence in the room. Mountains between here and Washington State, right? McGrath said, so let's assume they're not in Washington State yet. Or Oregon. Or California. Or Alaska or Hawaii. So we've cut it down already. Only 45 states to call, right? Let's go to work. They might have gone to Canada, Brogan said. Or Mexico, or a boat or a plane. Milosevic shrugged and took the atlas from him. You're too pessimistic, he said again. Needle in a damn haystack, Brogan said back. Three floors above them, the bureau fingerprint technicians were looking at the paintbrush Brogan had brought in. It had been used once only, by a fairly clumsy guy. The paint was matted up in the bristles, and had run onto the mild steel ferrule which bound the bristles into the wooden handle. The guy had used an action which had put his thumb on the back of the ferrule, and his first two fingers on the front. It was suggestive of a medium-height guy reaching up and brushing paint onto a flat surface, level with his head, maybe a little higher, the paintbrush handle pointing downward. A 4D Connor line was just a fraction less than 81 inches tall. Any sign writing would be about 70 inches off the ground. The computer could not calculate this guy's height, because it had only seen him sitting down inside the Lexus, but the way the brush had been used, he must have been 5'8", 5'9" reaching up and brushing just a little above his eye level. Brushing hard, with some lateral force. There wasn't going to be a lot of finesse in the finished job. Wet paint is a pretty good medium for trapping fingerprints, and the techs knew they weren't going to have a lot of trouble. But for the sake of completeness, they ran every process they had, from fluoroscopy down to the traditional grey powder. They ended up with three and a half good prints, clearly the thumb and the first two fingers of the right hand, with the extra bonus of a lateral half of the little finger. 
They enhanced the focus in the computer and sent the prints down the digital line to the Hoover Building in Washington. They added a code instructing the big database down there to search with maximum speed. In the labs at Quantico, the hunters were divided into two packs. The burned pickup had been torn apart, and half the staff was examining the minute physical traces unique to that particular vehicle. The other half was chasing through the fragmented records held by the manufacturers, listening out for the faint echoes of its construction and subsequent sales history. It was a Dodge, 10 years old, built in Detroit. The chassis number and the code stamped into the iron of the engine block were both original. The numbers enabled the manufacturer to identify the original shipment. The pickup had rolled out of the factory gate 1 April and had been loaded onto a railroad wagon and hauled to California. Then it had been driven to a dealership in Mojave. The dealer had paid the invoice in May, and beyond that, the manufacturer had no further knowledge of the vehicle. The dealership in Mojave had gone belly up two years later. New owners had bought the franchise. Current records were in their computer. Ancient history from before the change in ownership was all in storage. Not every day that a small automotive dealership on the edge of the desert gets a call from the FBI Academy at Quantico, so there was a promise of rapid action. The sales manager himself undertook to get the information and call right back. The vehicle itself was pretty much burned out. All the soft clues were gone. There were no plates. There was nothing significant in the interior. There were no bridge tokens, no tunnel tokens. The windshield stickers were gone. All that was left was the mud. The vehicle technicians had cut away both of the rear wheel wells, the full hoop of sheet metal right above the driven tires, and carried them carefully across to the materials analysis unit. Any vehicle writes its own itinerary in the layers of mud it throws up underneath. Bureau geologists were peeling back the layers and looking at where the pickup had been, and where it had come from. The mud was baked solid by the burning tires. Some of the softer crystals had vitrified into glass, but the layers were clear. The outer layers were thin. The geologists concluded they had been deposited during a long journey across the country. Then there was a couple of years' worth of mixed rock particles. The particular mixture was interesting. There was such a combination of sands there that identifying their exact origin should be easy enough. Under that mixture was a thick base layer of desert dust. Straight away, the geologists agreed that the truck had started its life out near the Mojave Desert. Every single law enforcement agency in 45 states had the description and the plate number of the stolen white econoline. Every single officer on duty in the whole nation had been briefed to look for it, parked or mobile, burned or hidden or abandoned. For a short time that Wednesday, that white econoline was the most hunted vehicle on the planet. McGraw was sitting at the head of the table in the quiet conference room, smoking, waiting. He was not optimistic. If the truck was parked and hidden, it would most likely never be found. The task was too huge. Any closed garage or building or barn could hide it forever. If it was still somewhere on the road, the chances were better. So the biggest gamble of his life was, after 48 hours, had they gotten where they were going, or were they still on their way? Two hours after starting the patient search, the fingerprint database brought back a name, Peter Wayne Bell. There was a perfect match, right hand, thumb and first two fingers. The computer rated the match on the partial from the little finger as very probable. 31 years old, Brogan said. From Mojave, California. Two convictions for sex offenses. Charged with a double rape, three years ago, didn't go down. Victims were three months in the hospital. This guy Bell had an alibi from three of his friends. Victims couldn't make the ID, too shaken up by the beatings. Nice guy, McGrath said. Milosevic nodded. And he's got Holly, he said. Right there in the back of his truck. McGrath said nothing in reply to that. Then the phone rang. He picked it up, listened to a short barked sentence. He sat there and Brogan and Milosevic saw his face light up like a guy who sees his teams all win the pennant on the same day, baseball and football and basketball and hockey. All on the same day that his son graduates summa cum laude from Harvard and his gold stocks go through the roof.
Arizona, he shouted. It's in Arizona, heading north on US 60. An old hand in an Arizona state police cruiser had spotted a white panel truck making bad lane changes round the sharp curves on US 60 as it winds away from the town of Globe, 70 miles east of Phoenix. He had pulled closer and read the plate. He saw the blue oval and the econoline script on the back. He had thumbed his mic and called it in. Then the world had gone crazy. He was told to stick with the truck, no matter what. He was told that helicopters would be coming in from Phoenix and Flagstaff, and from Albuquerque way over in New Mexico. Every available mobile unit would be coming in behind him from the south. Up ahead, the National Guard would be assembling a roadblock. Within 20 minutes, he was told, you'll have more backup than you've ever dreamed of. Until then, he was told, you're the most important lawman in America. The sales manager from the Dodge dealership in Mojave, California, called Quantico back within an hour. He'd been over to the storage room and dug out the records for the sales made 10 years ago by the previous franchise owners. The pickup in question had been sold to a citrus farmer down in Kendall, 50 miles south of Mojave, in May of that year. The guy had been back for servicing and emissions testing for the first four years, and after that, they'd never seen him again. He had bought on a four-year time payment plan and his name was Dutch Borken. A half hour later, the stolen white econoline was 28 miles farther north on U.S. 60 in Arizona and it was the tip of a long teardrop shape of 50 vehicles cruising behind it. Above it, five helicopters were hammering through the air. In front of it, 10 miles to the north, the highway was closed and another 40 vehicles were stationary on the pavement parked up in a neat arrowhead formation. The whole operation was being coordinated by the agent in charge from the FBI's Phoenix office. He was in the lead helicopter, staring down through the clear desert air at the roof of the truck. He was wearing a headset with a throat mic, and he was talking continuously. Okay, people, he said. Let's go for it, right now. Go, go, go. His lead chopper swooped upward out of the way and two others arrowed down. They hovered just in front of the truck, low down, one on each side, keeping pace. The police cars behind fanned out across the whole width of the highway and they all hit their lights and sirens together. A third chopper swung down and flew backward, right in front of the truck, eight feet off the ground, strobes flashing, rotors beating the air. The co-pilot started a sequence of clear gestures, hands wide, palms out, like he was personally slowing the truck. Then the sirens all stopped and the enormous bullhorn on the front of the helicopter fired up. The co-pilot's voice boomed out, amplified grotesquely beyond the point of distortion, clearly audible even over the thrashing and hammering of the rotor blades. Federal agents, his voice screamed, you are commanded to stop at once. I repeat, you are commanded to stop your vehicle at once. The truck kept on going. The helicopter right in front of it swung and wobbled in the air. Then it settled again, even closer to the windshield, flying backward, not more than 10 feet away. You are surrounded, the co-pilot shouted through the huge bullhorn. There are a hundred police officers behind you. The road is closed ahead. You have no option. You must slow your vehicle and come to a complete stop. You must do that right now. The cruisers all lit up their sirens again and two of them pulled alongside. The truck was locked into a solid raft of hostile traffic. It sped on for a long moment, then it slowed. Behind it, the frantic convoy braked and swerved. The helicopters rose up and kept pace. The truck slowed more. Police cruisers pulled alongside, too deep, door to door, bumper to bumper. The truck coasted to a halt. The helicopters held station overhead. The lead cars swerved around in front and jammed to a stop, inches from the truck's hood. All around, officers jumped out. The highway was thick with police. Even over the beating of the helicopter rotors, the crunching of shotgun mechanisms and the clicking of a hundred revolver hammers were clearly audible. In Chicago, McGraw did not hear the shotguns and the revolvers, but he could hear the Phoenix agent in charge shouting over the radio. The output from the throat mic in his helicopter was patched through Washington and was crackling out through a speaker on the long hardwood table. 
The guy was talking continuously, excited, half in a stream of instructions to his team, half as a running commentary on the sight he was seeing on the road below. McGraw was sitting there, hands cold and wet, staring at the noisy speaker like if he stared at it hard enough, it would change into a crystal ball and let him see what was going down. He's stopping, he's stopping, the guy in the helicopter was saying. He's stationary now, he's stopped on the road, he's surrounded. Hold your fire, wait for my word, they're not coming out, open the doors, open the damn doors and drag him out, okay, we got two guys in the front, two guys, one driver, one passenger. They're coming out, they're out, secure them, put them in a car, get the keys, open up the back, but watch out, there are two more in there with her. Okay, we're going to the back, we're going around to the rear, the doors are locked, back there, we're trying the key. You know what, there's still writing on the side of this truck. The writing is still there. It says Bright Spark Electrics. I thought it was supposed to be blanked out, right? Painted over or something. In Chicago, a deathly hush fell over the third floor conference room. McGraw went white. Milosevic looked at him. Brogan stared calmly out of the window. And why is it heading north? McGraw asked. Back toward Chicago. The crackling from the speaker was still there. They turned back toward it listened hard. They could hear the thump of the rotor blades behind the urgent voice. The rear doors are open, the voice said. The doors are open, they're open, we're going in, people are coming out, here they come, what the hell is this? There are dozens of people in there. There are maybe 20 people in there. They're all coming out, they're still coming out, there are 20 or 30 people in there. What the hell is going on here? The guy broke off. Evidently he was listening to a report radioed up from the ground. McGrath and Brogan and Milosevic stared at the hissing speaker. It stayed quiet for a long time. Nothing coming through at all except the guy's loud breathing and the hammering of the blades and the waterfall of static. Then the voice came back. Shit, it said. Shit, Washington, you there. You listening to this. You know what we just did. You know what you sent us to do. We just busted a load of wetbacks. About 30 illegals from Mexico. Just got picked up from the border. They're on their way up to Chicago. They say they all got jobs promised up there. End of part 2.